I never knew Charles Tandy. He was long dead by the time I had any involvement with Radio Shack. But he was a very important man, very important not just to the company, but to the country and the way we did business. He changed the world. And so today we're going to hear about Charles Tandy as told by his friend and colleague, John V. Roach. And this video is almost completely unedited. We just edited some, uh, some, some, some stuff out that was just basically uh, John, you know, stammering just like I am now. And other than that, it's pretty much the, the, the exact way he told it. So here he is, John Roach, talking about his friend, the remarkable Charles Tandy. Uh, Tandy bought Radio Shack in 1963, and it was essentially bankrupt. It had uh, nine stores. It had been pretty heavy in the mail order business and they had sold a lot of stuff on credit, on mail order, and uh, people didn't pay for it, and they, they were in real bad shape. And an envelope, uh, Char literally, uh, Charles worked out a plan with them and uh, took the business over, and uh, Tandy Leather really provided the cash flow uh, to really build the early part of Radio Shack. Uh, he bought lots of things. We had multiple belt, billfold, leather manufacturing businesses, uh, a huge department store that would make a Walmart super center look like a convenience store. I mean, it was about five square blocks in downtown Fort Worth. Uh, he uh, bought a dress chain, he bought color tile, he bought, uh, I don't know, we had uh, all kinds of unrelated businesses and what have you. And in 1975, he split up the corporation. After 1975, Tandy Corp was nothing but electronics and all the others for separate publicly traded companies. And in fact, Tandy Leather is still exists today. It's a survivor out of all that fun. Charles was really smart. He had, he was really financially smart and he uh, had more ideas in a day than a lot of people have in a lifetime. I mean, he, but, his strongest suit, uh, besides his financial understanding, was uh, he was a great teacher. He'd take anybody and anybody. He could make uh, ordinary people uh, do extraordinary things. Let me stop this for a moment and explain how Charles Tandy made you rich. At its peak, Tandy Corporation had over 7,000 retail stores. Each of those stores had a manager. Now, unlike most retail stores where you might get a bonus of a thousand or two each quarter, Charles Tandy would split the profits with you. And here's how that worked. Let's say your store sold $50,000 in a month. Your gross profit was $60,000 or $30,000. Your operating expenses were 35% or $10,500. That leaves you with $19,500 in profit. Your monthly bonus would be the same percentage of profit as it was a percentage. In this case, that's 39% uh, net profit or 39% of $10,500. That works out to $4,095. And that's about what it was in the mid-80s. Combine that with a salary of about $1,200 a month and you would make $63,500 a year. In 1985, the median household income was $23,620. So that's $150,000 a year in today's money. Plus you could invest a large percentage of that in Tandy stock, which Charles would match at about one-third which would, in theory, appreciate. Uh, but, it, but that would still leave you at double the median household income while you waited. The idea was even though running a small retail store is hard, if you could do it for 10 years, you would be a millionaire. For a new manager, Charles had set up a special program. You see, there were a large number of stores that would never be profitable, but were stuck in long-term leases. Rather than closing them and writing off the lease, Charles had this ingenious idea of how to kickstart new managers' financial path. If the store had lost a lot of money, you'd get one-third of the turnaround profit. So that meant if the last manager sucked, you would clean up. If he lost $20,000 last year in a month, and you had lost only $2,000 in the same month, 
he would give you $6,000 bonus for the month, almost $20,000 today. But that got even better if the store really sucked. Usually in blighted, often high crime neighborhoods, those were W or worse stores. In those stores, you would get one half of the turnaround profit. In the scenario above, you would have gotten 9,000 or close to 30 grand in today's dollars for a single month. And remember, he had over 100 districts and 30 regions. All of those management positions paid much the same way. All of those managers started as Radio Shack salespeople, and they are all put in a six-month manager's training program, which would sell to compete for the first promotions, which were almost always T and W stores. And what did this average Radio Shack store manager look like? Well, it depended on the district, but in the West Los Angeles district where I worked, there were about 30 stores. I was one of three white men, six managers were women, and 25 were immigrants from other countries. Our district manager was a Cuban national who had fled Cuba under Castro. We had managers from the Philippines, every Central American country, Israelis, and even two African managers. Maybe 20% had a college degree, and a, num and a number of them didn't even have high school degrees. The fact of the matter is, it did not matter. Only the numbers were allowed to dis dictate success at Radio Shack. So this strange, cigar-smoking Texan, well, honorary, who never came to work before 10 a.m., answered his own phone, not screening calls, and stayed up late talking on his CB radio, was running by far the most progressive company on earth. Always have the uh, highest respect for uh, the guys on Wall Street that would like to tell him how to run the business. Uh, he'd uh, tell them, uh, you know, uh, well, I won't tell you what he'd tell them, but it wouldn't be considered uh, appropriate in today's world. I can even say very simple, don't sell it because if you sell it because your wife wants a new sofa or a new car, it'll turn out to be the most expensive car ever made uh, because our stock's going to go up. And he was not bashful. He would tell anybody that they ought to buy his stock. A lot of people laughed him off and thought he was a little bit of a buffoon. And yet he probably made more millionaires than anybody I know. He believed in a well-tended patch. He he worked, I mean, he didn't work till about 10 or 11 in the morning, but he might go to 10 or 11 at night. And he uh, was always teaching, always. He gave me the same lecture on gross margin. This is about a 30 or 40 minute lecture at least 30 times, he wanted to be sure that everybody understood how important gross margin was. And we were a relatively high cost operator for a chain. And the reason we were high cost is stores were relatively low volume. And compliment Charles enough. He, he was very charismatic. He was, uh, uh, a great teacher, and in fact, uh, I remember uh, when he died unexpectedly at age 60, and a group of us were standing there talking, a lot of them had been around a lot longer than I had, and what have you, and they were worried, how in the world are we going to go forward without Charles? And I said, we're going to go forward without any trouble, because everybody has been taught how to do their job. In some respects, I didn't try to make uh, massive changes, particularly right away to the company. Uh, I, uh, because everybody knew what they was doing. Charles very much believed in keep things simple. If you keep it simple, everybody can do it. If you, uh, Charles was uh, a genius. If you haven't read it, uh, there's a book called Tandy's Money Machine uh, that uh, basically is about his life. Uh, it's very, I think you'd find it interesting reading. His uh, friends, uh, who was a director, uh, was selected to take over, and in all fairness, uh, his uh, expertise had not been as a businessman. Uh, he was more of a just a long-term friend of Charles's. And so in many respects on most things, uh, 
I was running a company, even though uh, there was lots of other uh, organization, but uh, uh, they, I was making most of the strategic calls and basically managing, uh, as I say, uh, the company and uh, then wasn't long after that, uh, uh, some of the corporate officers were out uh, on investor relations deal and they called me up and said, come quick. Uh, we can't answer all these people's questions. Thing, uh, Charles, I remember uh, uh, in an investor relations meeting uh, at a conference somewhere, uh, one of the uh, stock analysts asked him, well, how many uh, CB radios do you think you'll sell next quarter? And Charles said, uh, 64,000. And the guy says, how do you know you'll sell 64,000? Because that's how many we got. Radio Shack has the hottest thing on wheels today. Realistic two-way CB radio. We introduced our realistic CB line way back in 1960. And today we have 16 low-priced mobile and walkie-talkie models to choose from. Radio Shack also makes its own CB antennas, crystals, coax cables, and accessories. Equip your car, truck, or boat today with a realistic CB radio. Only at Radio Shack, a Tandy company.